This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our Earth Day special by looking at how indigenous people are protecting the Earth as we follow the journey of Ivy Camille Many Beads So, an award-winning queer Navajo filmmaker whose new film shows how corporations like Peabody, the world's largest private coal company, have devastated her homeland. She also connects with indigenous communities in Colombia in the Philippines, in Mexico, and at Standing Rock in North Dakota, facing the same types of struggles. This is the introduction to Powerlands. My name is Ivy Camille Many Beads So, and this is Dineta, also known as the Navajo Nation. My family can trace our history to 85 generations with this land. I began working on this film to document our community's struggle against resource colonization. Along the way, I found that we are not alone. This is a story of indigenous people protecting and rebuilding. Before we speak with Ivy Camille, this is another clip from Powerlands that features some of the Navajo elders and young land and water defenders in the film. They want the land from me. They want to take away my livelihood. The sheep and horses. These are the ways they try to intimidate us. If a horse roams close to the house, they say we have to pay a fee. For a long time, people were terrorized with livestock impoundments, having their livestock be forcibly taken away. And of course, that's traumatic for people, you know? They've done things where they've brought big trailers out here and have literally, you know, forced people into their homes, you know, with like, you know, guns. Before someone to point guns at elders and tell them to back up and for them to just come in here and take what's theirs, you know, it, it's just not right. And. You know, it really hurts that the people do that, you know? For more, we're joined by Ivy Camille Many Beads So, whose new film Powerlands just won the award for Best Feature at the 2022 American Documentary and Animation Film Festival. She's joining us from Flagstaff, Arizona, where there's a massive wildfire burning very close to where she lives. Ivy Camille, welcome to Democracy Now! Congratulations on your film. But before we talk about the film, can you talk about this fire that's exploding? right now um, in size and what and if it threatens you and your community yeah so the fire started um, I believe Tuesday we got the alert it was really rapid within like 15 minutes um, there were like four three or four evacuation notices that came out just um, like literally in rapid fire you'd like call somebody to check and then there'd be another street that was being evacuated because of the massive winds that were happening um, the firefighters are doing incredible to try to keep you know as many homes safe as possible but there's definitely been um, loss of homes and loss of property and loss of um, just a lot of loss you know you hear stories about families who had a one-year-old and all they could grab on their way out the door was the child, you know, and so they've lost everything. Um, but this community really is incredible and helping everybody get together and stand together in it. Um, on Tuesday, you know, I was out trying to help clear brush um, from places, especially with elders who had a hard time getting underneath their porches. 
But yeah, it's it's pretty close. It's moved a little bit further at the moment, but for about two days, the sky was just uh, full of smoke. I mean, your film is all about sustainability. And in fact, this fire that's exploded to something like 20,000 acres, fanned by high winds and fueled by the dry grass that you're um, dealing with. Um, the Arizona and the other western states are suffering an unprecedented mega drought brought on by the climate emergency. Yeah, and the desertification that's happened around here definitely can be tied directly into Peabody Coal and BHP. Um, they were, you know, pulling thousands and thousands of gallons of water out um, every day. Um, and in doing so, made it so that the the water resources down below are very depleted, which means that all the plant life is dying quickly. So there's a lot of brush for it to move. Um, and then the winds, as I've heard from recent people, um, is just they're going to keep staying this way. We're going to have high winds um, in this area due to climate change. Well, I want to go back to another clip of your award-winning film, Powerlands, Thank on the you. resistance of Dine of Navajo youth. <laughs> Younger generations are returning to Dineta, building unity and resistance. <laughs> this lake, it's called the Morgan Lake. It was um, built to cool down the power plant, which is one of the dirtiest coal-fired power plants in the country. They've extracted uranium. They extract oil and gas by fracking. They extract coal. All around, there is this resource colonization, this resource extraction. An average person in Phoenix uses about 200 gallons per day as far as domestic use. And a person in Big Mountain, they use about 12 gallons a day. You know, corporations and dirty politicians, you know, they're all about money. You know, they want money, 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 money. I'd like for these guys to have them try to eat money, you know, and see what happens to them. Have them drink oil or drink water that's contaminated with oil, you know. I don't think they're going to last. So, Ivy Camille, you deal with coal here. Talk more about the largest private coal company in the world that people, particularly um, uh, Native peoples in Arizona, are dealing with, uh, Peabody. Um, and the whole issue of um, how it has affected um, your livelihoods, your lives. Yeah, well, um, I was born into the resistance out of Black Mesa. My, um, the matriarch of my family, Meso, passed away in 2021 due to COVID. Um, and, you know, we saw that throughout the res. Um, but so I've grown up having it impacted my entire life. I grew up knowing about HBL versus NPL and what that meant and what it meant um, to, you know, carry my name and carry that forward into the world and how you need to hold yourself as an Indigenous woman and as well as, um, you know, I was taught being raised that we are shepherds, that we do not own the earth, we belong to the earth. And so in that sense, we have to, you know, make it better and continue doing so. And one of the ways to do that currently is to, you know, help stop climate change and to help stop this massive extraction of these, you know, very precious resources. Uh, you know, before we move on to the global um, picture, I wanted to ask you about an issue you refer to in the film. You don't focus on it, but it's certainly one I'm sure you know. Um, earlier this week, Marketplace published an article titled, A Ban on Russian Uranium Could Impact Tribal Communities in the Southwest. The article reports some U.S. lawmakers unhappy with American nuclear power plants' reliance on imported Russian uranium are pushing for a ban on those purchases. About 16 percent of the uranium that fuels the electricity-generating facilities comes from Russia. An additional 30 percent is imported from Russia's partner nations, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. If the ban comes to pass, the U.S. uranium industry would have an opportunity to ramp up domestic mining. But many indigenous communities are still reeling from the impact of the last uranium boom. 
On Navajo lands, for instance, there were more than 500 abandoned mines, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. So that was a report from Marketplace. But the residue of the impact that um, uranium mining has had on indigenous communities, particularly the Navajo, uh, the Diné, particularly the Hopi, um, in Arizona? Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up knowing where the open pits were, where they're just filled in with concrete. That's the only protection against them. The um, miners, the old miners would actually be given blocks um, that weren't that weren't usable blocks, but would still have radiation and uranium in them, and they would build their houses with it. So it would infect, you know, their wives, their children, um, and generations on. So we're still dealing with those, and all it is to stop those buildings is just a fence. Um, and I've grown up seeing it. You, you know, we get taught knowing not to drink certain water sources because they are contaminated with uranium. Um, and a lot of people don't have any options. You look at places like Cameron, where it has some of the highest radiation in the entire world, and it's like everyday people are living there and doing their things. And it's, you know, right off of 89, which right now is affected by the fire, but there are tourists and people going through every single day. So it's not just affecting, um, you know, the Diné Nation, like it's affecting everybody who's passing through it. Um, any truck drivers, tourists, whatever, you're unwittingly and unknowingly being contaminated by these open pits and leftover radiation that we are still attempting to clean up and deal with. And, of course, these uranium tailings, highly carcinogenic, um, the uh, issue of cancer in the Navajo indigenous communities in the Southwest, Ivy Camille. Yeah, we're seeing a huge spike um, within, you know, cancer rates. There's um, issues with pregnancy. There's issues there's, there's so much that you can see. It's really just without going into statistics, just looking around, you're seeing people get cancer who, you know, it doesn't normally pop up in our family bloodlines. You're seeing people um, losing certain like mental faculties quickly, like way faster than they should be uh, because of this radiation. You can see the effects in um, all over the res and then even in out spreading outlying areas because they're also being contaminated. It's not just like contained in a city. We're speaking with Ivy Camille Many Beats So, award winning queer Navajo filmmaker whose new film Powerlands just won a major award, follows her journey examining corporations like BHP that have devastated her home and connecting with indigenous communities in Colombia, the Philippines, Mexico, and Standing Rock facing the same struggles. We're going to go to a another clip from Powerlands now. Um, it, we go to the peninsula of La Guajira, in the northern tip of Colombia, close to the border of Venezuela. This is the site of the Cereon large open-pit coal mine, owned by the UK-Swiss-Australian conglomerate of BHP Glencore. This is Ms. Eneda, who has been repeatedly displaced by Glencore in the film Powerlands. They took away our water and electricity. They took everything away because we had to leave one way or another, taking things away from us to force us out. A clip from Powerlands. Uh, tell us who Aneda is, um, uh, as well as um, what is happening in Colombia now. Ivy Camille. Yeah. So really, Aneda and all of the women in the film are these matriarchs of these communities. Uh, that's uh, in traditional Diné culture, we're a matriarchal society. So they're the ones leading the resistance. They're the ones cooking the food. They're the ones holding these communities. They're the ones holding the space for it. Um, so that's one of my favorite parts of the film is seeing all these like really strong, incredible indigenous women. And then in Colombia, oh, shoot, I should have been more prepared. Um, there's still resistance going on. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot to be told about it, and really everywhere. I think, truthfully, the most important thing about the film to know is that it's for Indigenous people, by Indigenous people, or an Indigenous person, and it's about showing this global scale, because it's Colombia, Oaxaca, Standing Rock, Black Mesa, and the Philippines, all of these places seem so vast and far apart, but truthfully, it's 
everywhere. Um, there were so many places that we reached out to that, you know, weren't ready to speak with us at the time, weren't ready to go there. And we are seeing um, them coming out with our stories now. But truthfully, so many of these communities, like in Colombia, have no Wi-Fi. They don't have access to being able to reach out um you know, to other people, all of the energy is co being sourced from these communities, but they get none of it for themselves. And, um, you know, so having a film like this and showing it and having a way to be able to tell all of these communities, like you're not alone. Um, you know, we're all here with you and here are more forms of resistance. Here are more people continuing to fight and like, please tell your own stories. I mean, it's amazing what you show in Colombia. You say the coal from that mine is shipped to Europe, about a third sent to the U.S. and elsewhere in the Americas. The mine's taken over about 270 square miles of land larger than the city of Chicago. Um, and yes. can you talk about all the forms of resistance, from the food to the language, the art, the culture? Well, and I think in all of these indigenous communities, the simple tasks are the ones that, um, you know, preserve our culture and our heritage because there is a massive genocide going on. Um, they are wanting to eradicate our voices. They want to eradicate our ways of life. They want to eradicate our culture. And so continuously it, going out and listening to an elder speak, learning how to cook the traditional foods, learning how to make the traditional clothes, learning how to make the traditional tools are especially helpful going forward in this climate change because we have obviously lived in extreme climates. And so we know how to farm in desert climates without using up all the water. There's um, lots of different resources that can go forward, um, you know, just in the indigenous communities and indigenous worlds. And I think that those simple things, you know, as a kid going out and listening to my grandma, I'm so thankful for the moments that I got to have with her because every time an elder dies, that entire lifeline of stories and everything dies with them. And so the more people who go out and hear those stories and document them, you know, the, the more we will have for this preservation. So we're going to continue on your journey, um, Ivy Camille. Powerlands features the community of Bangmal in the Philippines, in Mindanao, where indigenous earth defenders successfully forced out Glencore's copper mine, a gold copper mine, in Tapacan in 2015. This is a clip. The central part of our area here is where they plan to put a wastewater dam. I told our people here to listen to their hearts before allowing the mines in. We know what their intentions are, to seize our resources. I want to continue on the journey and then have you put these two together, going from the Philippines to Mexico, to specifically to Oaxaca. In Powerlands, this is one of the Earth Defenders, Ivy Camille, that you speak to. We've seen in other towns that, no, it's not true that wind projects bring benefits. And people realized that, and they decided to fight back with a resounding no. Why? Because we live off the ocean. Zapotec and other indigenous communities in the region have for years been resisting wind farm megaprojects that are displacing them from their ancestral lands. And that's particularly interesting as you fight for sustainability. We're talking about wind farms. Work your way backwards. Start here in Oaxaca, and then we'll talk about the Philippines. Yeah, well, one, that clip that you just played, being on set with that with that man was incredible. Um, I don't speak Spanish, and so I was just feeling what he was feeling and then getting translated afterwards. But the emotion, the care, the love that is, you know, in all of these is evident even without words um, from these communities. It's incredible. And yet— um, in Oaxaca, you're seeing a massive displacement that's going on. Without proper care and treatment of these wind farms, you're also seeing uh, pollution entering water sources, you know, that's cutting off their um, food resources. So what's really incredible about Oaxaca is they are doing um, the, oh, what's the actual, but they are making their own community wind farm that's going to be held to higher standards and also will provide power to that community because, again, these communities aren't being provided the power that they are giving to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, Oaxaca was incredible to see these people, so much like color and light and everything coming out of it. Um, I think that was one of my favorite places to film because without language, like it, it was just incredible. 
And your time in Mindanao, your time in the Philippines, the struggle that is going on there. Yeah, so I was not able to go to the Philippines. My producer, who you've actually had on for, Jordan Flaherty, was there for the Philippines. Um, but really, it was incredible. Again, the same struggle, the same resistance. You're seeing these people, like, show these foods and these ancestral healing things that I know we have here on the reservation and you're seeing it in every single community we're going to. There's things to treat chronic cough. There's things to treat, um, you know, like sore hands, bad backs, even stomach problems that we don't have currently going around. But when you listen to these indigenous communities, you're finding out the root basic of a lot of the um, pharmaceuticals that we have also in those uh, where, where it originally comes from. And it's brilliant to see. So, Ivy Camille, many beads so. Um, as you take us on this journey in this powerful film called Powerlands, um, talk about why you called it Powerlands. You've been doing this since you were 19. What started you on this path? Yeah. So, yeah, we've been doing it for about eight years. Um, what really started was— um, Jordan had been filming in Colombia. I was filming in Black Mesa, and we were looking at the parallels between them, and they're both affected by BHP. And, you know, if you took away the language, I would not tell the difference between Colombia and Black Mesa, besides maybe the monkeys. Um, it is incredible. You know, growing up in Black Mesa, we would constantly have to be careful of, like, what day the mine was going or what things, because you would have at, you would have um, the coal coming down and affecting clothing or affecting certain livestock. And it was the same stuff that we were hearing in Colombia. And that was really the beginning of this story, was um, seeing the parallels. And then from there, Jordan went to um, the Philippines while we were in Oaxaca. That's when I found out about Standing Rock. And so we went up to Standing Rock immediately afterwards. And Kim, um, who was one of the people featured in the film, was one of the first people to arrive at Standing Rock and set up there. And it's been cool to also see how um, that transition between communities and the collaboration that's been going. Even recently, Bettina was in LA working with my composer, who's also been on the show, Daniel French, um, and was able to speak with him right while as he was, you know, making the soundtrack for the film. And it was really cool because that influenced it as well. Finally, Ivy Camille, you say as you cover the resistance around the world, your film is part of that resistance. We have 15 seconds. Yes, this film is for Indigenous people, you are not alone. We are here. Um, and if anyone else learns something from it, great. <laughs>